So Katya, you're going to start it? Or? I will start, but I'm just watching the attendee count. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are. But uh, we're still having a couple of people join in um, because it takes time for everybody to be led into the webinar. So I'll wait for another 15 seconds or so. Because as I'm saying that I'll wait, I can see that the attendee count slowed down. So we'll start and it's 11.01. Um, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another edition of the Microstructure Exchange Online Seminar. Uh, before we start, one announcement. Uh, we do have a call for papers outstanding with a deadline coming uh, November 19, I believe. Uh, uh, for the winter presentations, please check out the website for Microstructure Exchange and submit your papers if you haven't done so yet. Um, as a reminder of the rules of the seminar, Pete is going to talk for about 45 minutes uh, with some breaks so please submit your questions through the Q&A and if you have a question if you see a question that you like please upvote it uh, rather than if you have a similar question please up upvote the question that's already there um, at the end we'll enable the raise hand function and you'll be able to ask answer your questions live and Pete has also agreed to stay with us for longer if there are more questions. So you'll get your question addressed. And thank you again for joining us. We're very happy to have with us Pete Kyle. Thank you very much, Pete, for coming. And Pete will talk to us about large bets and stock market crashes. The floor is all yours. OK, well, thank you very much, Katya. Um, yeah, this paper is called Large Bets and Stock Market Crashes. It's a joint paper uh, with Anna Obajayeva at the New Economic School. Um, I, I'm hoping she can join us, but I don't think she can because she's, she's basically become a dean there and has a lot of uh, other things that have been keeping her busy uh, recently, but she said maybe some of her students were going to join. Um, so the reason I, I picked this paper to give, uh, there, there are several reasons for it. Number one, it's a paper we've been revising recently, even though it's been around for a long time. Uh, my slides don't incorporate all the revisions, so my comments today may not. Uh, follow the slides all that closely. The second reason for this paper is that I was thinking there might be a stock market crash uh, at some point, and I was thinking it might occur in October, November. It, it looks like it hasn't occurred yet, um, but it's interesting to speculate about what it would take to generate a stock market crash in the United States. And uh, to, to go to the conclusion, um, the, I think that the analysis that I'm going to present suggests that if individual investors withdrew a couple hundred billion uh, dollars from stock market uh, ETFs and mutual funds over the space of maybe three days, that would trigger a stock market crash, you know, potentially 20% uh, or something like the 87 crash. Um, now, you know, the, 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 um, this estimate is somewhat imprecise, um, but it's kind of an extrapolation of uh, what I'm gonna talk about. Um, and the third reason for giving this paper is that I think the area of stock market crashes is under-researched and it raises many issues that are associated with market microstructure uh, that we uh, need to think about. Um, so let me get started. Um, the, there, there are kind of two types of crashes that you might think about. There are the ones that where the entire economy crashes. Uh, you typically have a sovereign debt default. You might have some inflation. You have a collapse of the banking system, the kind of things documented by Reinhardt and Rogoff. We're not gonna be talking about those. We're gonna be talking about stock market crashes that are triggered by what we call large bets. Um, and typically uh, what that means is that the market collapses, um, but the collapse is not permanent and, and the market will come back eventually if uh, fundamentals remain sound. And typically the fundamentals do remain sound uh, because you're not having the, the banking crisis and the uh, inflation and uh, the collapse of other financial institutions. Um, that's, of course, assuming appropriate government policy um, is followed. Um, so our basic idea is to use uh, this theory of market microstructure invariance, or maybe it's an empirical um, idea, um, and think of a stock market crash as generated by a large bet. So we think of um, typical for a typical stock, the uh, way prices change is that large institutional investors, maybe they get some information, 
they come into the market, they trade a, a fairly large quantity. We used to call it a block trade, but now it might be many small trades spread out over time, but all kind of in the same direction. And this uh, trading of uh, large institutions has price impact and that price impact generates uh, the volatility um, in the market. So we're gonna take this idea, which we've, we've kind of tested for individual stocks and we're gonna try to extrapolate it to the whole market. So we'll think of the entire stock market as one gigantic market. And then we'll, we'll think, think about how to do the extrapolation. And we're gonna extrapolate from uh, this paper that used portfolio transitions, uh, uh, which are uh, a good, good data on individual stocks to measure not only the price impact of bets, but also the size of the bets. So we can not only ask uh, what the uh, uh, price impact is of these gigantic bets, but we can look at the distribution of the size of the bets and see if the large bets that explain the stock market crashes are appropriately large outliers uh, in that uh, distribution uh, for um, uh, bet size for the entire stock market. So that's our basic idea. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply it to five stock market crashes. And the reason we picked these five stock market crashes is that we have data on the quantities that uh, were sold. Um, and so we, we have some idea of uh, how to uh, think about stock market crashes as being triggered uh, by large bets. There are some other crash-like events that, that just don't have good data. Um, and this is um, actually one of the reasons for talking about this paper. For example, there was a flash rally. It was a kind of reverse crash in the bond market, the United States Treasury bond market back in October of uh, uh, several years ago, maybe it was 2016. Um, and that was studied by the Fed and by the other government agencies, um, but they didn't actually come up with uh, quantities traded by uh, particular investors. So we didn't include that as a reverse crash um, in this particular study. And it raises the market microstructure question of whether we need better data. Uh, we may be getting it in the stock market with, um, with uh, audit trail. We, we, uh, you're getting it, I think, in Europe. Uh, there's much more transparency, as particularly about bonds than there used to be. So maybe things are being improved. But anyway, the five crashes we have can be divided into two categories. Uh, one category is the large uh, crashes. The 1929 crash, this was uh, a crash that was generally considered to be caused by lots of institutional investors uh, who were trading with margin accounts, getting margin calls that resulted in liquidations of their positions, all kind of based on the same price declines and therefore occurring more or less at the same time. Although it was, it was actually spread out over days, days, weeks, or months, but it was um, uh, uh, relatively um, uh, compressed in time on certain days. Uh, then we have the 1987 portfolio uh, insurance crash, and there are portfolio insurers that was a trading strategy that mimicked uh, uh, mimicked uh, buying the buying and selling you would do to replicate um, an option. Um, they were uh, selling large quantities of stock index futures contracts as the market fell to replicate uh, an option position on the entire market. Uh, that got uh, studied very carefully by the uh, Brady Commission report. Um, and I guess I should uh, give a disclaimer that um, I actually worked as a staff member for the Brady Commission. So I, uh, you know, I, I participated in this particular study um, and, and helped put together some of the tables in the Brady Commission report. Um, and then another big, pretty big crash was in 2008, there was this rogue trader, Jerome Criviel, who had accumulated a position of like 50 billion euros, <laughs> uh, hit it from the risk management people at Societe Generale. And then when it was discovered, they gave him three days to liquidate the position. So all of a sudden, 50 billion euros of stock index uh, contracts were liquidated over a very short period of time. Okay, and then there are two other crashes, one of which, uh, both of which we call flash crashes. One of them is the flash crash of 2010, which was a much smaller event. It was compressed into a much shorter period of time. It involved sales or bets that were much smaller. Um, and uh, uh, prices went down about 5% and then recovered. And then there's the, uh, in the 87 crash, there were a couple of days later, there was a flash crash uh, there that was kind of separate from the main crash. The main crash was on Monday, October 19th, 1987. This one was on Thursday morning. And uh, George Soros uh, made a, a very large sale at the open of trading and the market went down 20% pretty much instantaneously and then bounced back. So those are our five uh, stock market crashes that we're gonna study. And how are we gonna study them? Well, 
uh, we're going to contrast our way of thinking with what we call conventional wisdom. And then in the, the version of the paper I've circulated, there's another idea in between that the, there's a kind of finance literature on block trades that kind of sits in between our approach and the conventional wisdom. But the conventional wisdom that we associate with many well-known uh, finan financial economists, Merton Miller, Myron Schultz, Jean Fama, Hayne Leland, Mark, Mark Rubenstein, um, they, they all hold that prices react to changes in fundamentals and uh, that fundamentals means that their prices are acting to, reacting to information and that the quantities traded don't have much of an effect on prices. Um, that, that is that the demand for uh, stocks is kind of elastic. Um, so uh, thinking of it in terms of demand elasticity, I don't know if it's the best way to think about it, but um, let's, let's try to think about it in terms um, of demand elasticity. So Merton Miller said that it was kind of unreasonable to expect that selling you know, one or 2% of the uh, uh, US equity market would lead to a price decline of 30%. He thought that um, the, the demand for stocks was, was more elastic than that and one or 2% of uh, market cap sales should lead to price declines that were probably less than one or 2%, meaning that the market uh, demand schedule for, for stocks was elastic. So we're gonna define the conventional wisdom as an elasticity of one or minus one, since it's an event, if you think of it as a demand elasticity. Uh, the Brady Report also contained a discussion of the 1929 crash, and they, they, they concluded that the price elasticity would, um, of 0.9 with respect to trading volume seemed really high. I don't wanna go into interpreting exactly what that meant, but they essentially um, thought of it in terms of elasticity as well. And so they, this conventional wisdom would suggest based on typical turnover rates for stocks that trading 5% of daily volume or even 25% of daily volume would have very small price impact. Five or 10% close to zero, 25% um, would have a, a very small effect, you know, less than 1%, maybe 20 basis points. Um, so we can think of this mathematically as just the idea that the price elasticity of demand is one as the conventional wisdom is sort of a hypothesis that we think is wrong. Um, and that is that the percentage change in price in response to selling Q shares when they're in shares outstanding should uh, be, if, it's, if the elasticity is one, that change in price should be approximately Q over N. And you can express it in daily uh, units um, by um, uh, uh, in terms of volume in daily units, and then it becomes Q over 250 times V, where V is the daily volume um, in shares. But anyway, the, this conventional math um, is, uh, is, is what we're gonna try to question. And we're gonna disagree with it because we think that large trades, even those that don't have any information content like the margin sales in 29 or the portfolio insurance sales in 1987 or John Corviel's trades um, probably, that they do have a large uh, effect on prices and that selling 1% of market capitalization of a, of a, of a stock can lead to uh, uh, declines in the, or 1% of market capitalization of the index can lead to decline in index prices of 20 or 50%. And on a log scale, it becomes like something like 100%. So instead of elasticity of minus one, we think the elasticity is maybe something like minus 0.01. Uh, it's 100 times more inelastic than the conventional wisdom thinks if you were talking about the market as a whole. Um, and if you convert it into um, uh, daily volume, uh, we think that selling 10% of average daily volume in the entire market can lead to price declines of two or 300 basis points. Again, when you do the kind of the arithmetic, you know, this is up to 100 times less elastic than the conventional wisdom thinks. Now, there's also this idea that animal spirits kind of create crashes. But uh, I don't. I think there's zero evidence for this, including Schiller's paper, because uh, Schiller's paper basically was a poll based on a poll taken after the crash. Um, and yes, crashes cause people to panic. But uh, in 29 and 87, and in, in the Jerome Curviel situation, there was really no evidence of panic before these events uh, actually happened. The only person who might have panicked was not a retail trader, but that was George Soros in 1987, and he, he would be one of the world's big experts. Um, and whether he panicked or not is an interesting question. We think he didn't panic either. He was just following his trading discipline. So let me pause here for questions. So at the moment we have, um, oh, I was just gonna say no open question and Q&A. <laughs> and, uh, uh, 
which is fine. Thank I you, got lots Jane. of pauses. Uh, no, now we actually do have a very okay. long question. <laughs> I, I'm trying to read it, but uh, I don't know if you can see it. So I'll read it out I loud. Uh -huh. uh, I understand that if you don't trade fast enough, then prices won't move and too much quick trading causes bubbles or crashes. But in an artificial intelligence pound powered multi-participant setting how will anyone coordinate determine and regulate the right quote-unquote amount of buying selling and liquidity provision in free markets in response to rapidly changing fundamentals or stimulus when everyone is trying to be the first historic volumes appear a bit irrelevant as benchmarks when ai starts anticipating unprecedented events like dot-com september 2008 or march 2020 Okay, well, I actually was going to make a comment myself that was very similar to this comment, so I think this is a really relevant comment. Um, and so one of the questions that, that, that this raises is illustrated by the 87 crash. So, so uh, Hang Leland and Mark uh, Rubenstein uh, thought that if you made the trading very transparent, the uh, other side would show up. There was a lot of emphasis on sunshine trading. But for the other side to show up and take the other side of your bet without much price impact requires coordination by the rest of the market. And if crash type situations occur very infrequently, it's hard for everyone to get the coordination kind of scheduled in a correct manner. It's a different situation if let's say the government is auctioning uh, treasury debt and they do it every week or every month and on a regular schedule and you can uh, see that if, um, uh, if there's a big profit opportunity because not enough liquidity was provided at one auction, you can see that whether it's artificial intelligence or just human, natural human intelligence, you can see how the coordination would develop over time and there would be less price impact. So I think this is a fantastic question uh, for research. We don't understand the answer to the question. I think that artificial intelligence type based trading strategies are going to have a hard time uh, coordinating and I, uh, my future research, I plan to actually study this with simulation. So I, I think it's a good, good question. So should I keep going or is there another question? There's another question from uh, Cameron Pfeiffer. Um, have you seen uh, Gabay and Kojan's recent working paper about elasticities? So they make very similar prediction to yours through a slightly different lens. Uh, he does not have a real question, but wondering if you have seen the paper and if so, if you can. I have, but I haven't. I, I'm not sure if we, in the new version of the paper, we actually comment comment on it. But uh, it's something on my radar screen to pay more attention to. So, it's a uh, it good comment. Thanks. Um, so I should keep going. Yes, please. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Okay. So uh, let me just quickly summarize uh, microstructure invariance. I hope I can do this in a couple of minutes. Um, but the basic idea is that if that markets for very actively traded stocks uh, operate at a very fast pace, inactive uh, stocks operate at a slow pace. And what we want to capture is the idea that the, the way in which trading takes place, it's actually the same for stocks. It's just that the time scale uh, is different. Um, so if you adjust the time scale, all these stocks, markets for all these different stocks, liquid and illiquid, should look alike. And so the key uh, statistic that I want to talk about is what we call trading activity that we call W. It's the product of dollar volume and the volatility of the asset. And it's a real simple idea, but the simple idea is that dollar volume doesn't really capture how much is taking, uh, how much real activity is taking place in the market because the market is all about exchanging risks. And if you're trading uh, one week treasury bills, uh, you can trade many billions of dollars of them and you're not exchanging much risk at all because their price is very stable. On the other hand, if you're trading a, a very small uh, volatile stock, uh, a, the same dollar volume would be um, ridiculously large. And so the way to correct dollar volume to make it measure kind of the, the, the amount of risk that's being exchanged is very simple. You just multiply it by the standard deviation of returns um, on the asset. And the product of these two things is what we call trading activity. Uh, now, most people haven't used trading activity historically. Um, and I think the reason for it is that trading activity has funny units. Dollar volume has units of something like dollars per day. Returns variance has units of uh, uh, per day, but that means standard deviation has units of per square root of a day. And that means that this trading activity variable has units of dollars per three halves power of a day. So these are definitely weird units. And I think that scared people off of using this as a, as a, a measure. But we think that, that uh, being scared off is, the, is actually the wrong thing, uh, wrong, wrong way to think about it. The right way to think about it was to just to fully embrace it. 
And if you fully embrace it, we left it out here, you should divide by something measured in dollars. We call that C, the cost of a bet that I wanna not talk about today. But the main thing is to uh, think about the length of a unit of business time, which we could think of as the time it takes, uh, the, the, the rate at which bets arrive. So if, if there's 100 bets per day, uh, there are 100 bets per day on the market. It's about one bet every four minutes. So H would be four, uh, four minutes. Um, then H turns out to be proportional to the minus two thirds power of this trading activity variable, which uh, converts the, the units of uh, one over three halves power of time into just units of time. So that's the main idea. And I'm gonna skip this slide and actually skip the pause and go to this proof. And then I'll go back to the questions. So here's the just a quickest proof that we can think of that we hope is very intuitive of where you, how you get invariance. Um, based on uh, thinking about the size of bets. So the key question we wanna think about here, are how big are bets? Uh, and in particular, how does the size of bets change as trading activity changes? Clearly, if you go from a very illiquid stock to a bigger stock, probably the bets get bigger, but also the number of bets get bigger. So uh, th the question then is, uh, how does this as market, um, market as, as trading activity changes, how do the number of bets and the sizes of the bets uh, change? Well, we can write trading activity as the product of gamma, which is going to denote the number of bets per day times average bet size, because the number of bets per day times average bet size is just volume. Um, and so we can write uh, trading activity as, as the product of volume times price times sigma, uh, the way we defined it. And then our invariance conjecture essentially is that if we adjust for business time, the sizes of bets becomes the same across markets. Well, how do you adjust for business time? You just divide, uh, excuse me, multiply the uh, risk transferred by one bet, it's kind of the same idea as the risk transferred by the market, except this is one bet, multiply it by the link, uh, square root of this length of business time to convert the standard deviation of the returns into the standard deviation of returns over one uh, unit of business time. Uh, gamma is just the reciprocal of H, so you can also write this as um, uh, Q bar times P sigma, the risk transferred by one bet divided by the square root of gamma. Well, now if you look at these two equations, we have two equations uh, pretty much everything in these equations is easily observable except for gamma. So we can solve and, and Q bar. So we can solve for gamma and Q bar. It's very easy to do the, to solve for it because if you define Q bar P sigma as A and gamma as B, the equations can be written A times B equals W and A times V to the minus one half is some constant. Then the solution says that the size of the bets um, measured as, um, as, as the risk that they transfer is proportional to the cube root of trading activity. And the number of bets is proportional to the two thirds power of trading activity. Of course, these exponents of one third and two thirds have to add up to total trading activity. So they have to add up to one. And so you get this simple argument that says that the exponents are one third and two thirds. So now that with that, uh, let me go back and pause for questions. Any questions about this? So not at the moment. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, so, I think it was so fast, but if anybody has questions, please continue to submit through the okay. Q&A and then uh, we'll, I'm sure there will pause this comment, so. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of papers I'm not going to talk about uh, that discuss different angles that uh, ways to derive this and think about it and also different results that are empirical results, um, but uh, I'm going to just leave it at what I just showed you. Um, and we're gonna have two different sets of implications. I, I looked at the implications for the sizes of the bets. Um, and if you look at this data set on portfolio transitions that, that uh, Anya has, um, a portfolio transition is a, just uh, we'll just think of it here as a good data set to use for measuring price impact because the bets themselves are kind of exogenous. They don't, um, they don't have a lot of selection bias or other problems of bias that you get with these um, trying to measure price impact. And when you measure price impact, um, we're looking for the idea that as trading volume increases, the uh, sizes of the trades as a fraction of volume decrease. Remember the absolute size of the trades is increasing with the one third power. So as a fraction of volume, it's decreasing with the two thirds power. So if we take the size of the bet as a fraction of volume and multiply it by trading activity to the two thirds power, we should get a kind of an invariant distribution. Certainly the mean should be invariant, but maybe the whole shape of the distribution is invariant across stocks. Um, and when we looked at that, this is from the other paper, we find that these distributions look pretty invariant. 
Um, the coefficients we estimate are not exactly one third and two thirds, but there's something, I, I don't remember them exactly, maybe 0.37 and 0.63 or so, something like that, but close to one third and two thirds. Um, there are a whole bunch of other papers that we've written that have different uh, angles uh, approaching this and they all kind of come to the same thing. Um, so I don't, I suppose there are no more questions, but let's pause just in case there are. So the, the, if, if there are questions, any questions? So uh, at, at the moment, none. Okay, uh, good. Um, I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about this picture. Um, so uh, let, me, uh, let me explain how this picture works. Um, on the horizontal axis, we have the log of W, it's normalized by something called W star, but just think of it as the log of trading activity and W star is a kind of typical benchmark stock. Um, and so what should happen is, uh, as trading activity goes up is that the bets get bigger proportionally to the um, one third power of W, but the uh, sizes of the bets as a, as a fraction of daily volume get smaller uh, with, a, with um, an exponent of two thirds. And then if you look at the largest outliers of the uh, portfolio transition orders. These would be the, 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 the really, really large portfolio transition orders. We can kind of compare those with the five stock market crashes that we want to study. And what you see is, yes, consistent with the theory, they don't lie on a horizontal line, meaning that the, the vertical axis here is the, the order size as a fraction of volume uh, in logs. Um, that they don't lie on a horizontal line, they lie on a downward sloping line. And what that's telling us is that when you get into a very liquid market, like Apple stock would be way over here to the right, the, the biggest orders as a fraction of uh, average daily volume are, are, are gonna be kind of small. You know, Maybe they're gonna be 5% or 10% of average daily volume, but those would be gigantic orders for that stock. On the other hand, if you're over here in the illiquid stocks, the gigantic orders are more than 100% of average daily volume. Um, and so there's a huge amount of uh, variation that's pretty systematic. Well, this tells you uh, something, uh, what we're gonna do, our basic idea is gonna be, we wanna extrapolate from individual stocks to the market as a whole. And when we do that extrapolation, um, what we're gonna find is these stock market crashes are of course, a big, uh, big outliers. And they're, uh, what makes them outliers is um, uh, where they lie relative to what normal volume would be. So let's take the Societe Generale um, example. Uh, there, the sales were about 25% of the entire trading volume of the European stock market, uh, futures markets, plus cash markets, all added together across all the countries in Europe. And if you were uh, Hain Leland or Mark Rubenstein, uh, what you might do is you might extrapolate horizontally and say, well, 25% of trading volume is not so unusual. You get that all the time um, in individual stocks. But what we're saying is, no, that's not the right way to extrapolate. You should extrapolate along these lines that are parallel to lines with a slope of uh, minus two thirds. The red line here is a median bet. The blue is a blue points are above the median bet substantially by two standard deviations or more because they're the outlier points or the uh, largest, largest 1% or one tenth of 1%. Um, we think that you should extrapolate along the green lines. And if you extrapolate along the green lines, well, then the Societe Generale bet is not a, uh, uh, is, is, is not a typical thing that happens all the time at all. You would extrapolate up to here somewhere where I'm pointing on the vertical axis where it says STD six. And that means it's six standard deviations of a log normal distribution um, away from the median. Um, th there's uh, an issue here, six standard deviations. How, how often does the six standard deviation event occur? And the answer is basically it would never occur. So. Uh, there's something maybe wrong with our standard deviation measures, but if it were a five standard deviation event, then it would occur with the frequency that you see these big crashes, you know, like at once every 10 years or something like that, you would expect to see uh, one of these events. So um, our, our invariance theory just says that thinking in terms of fraction of daily volume as if that extrapolated horizontally across uh, assets is wrong and that you want to extra extrapolate along these uh, parallel lines and recognize that 25% of average daily volume for the market is something totally different from 25% of average daily volume for an individual stock. Instead of being a two or three standard deviation event, it's more like a five or six standard deviation event um, and something that is uh, very, very unusual. Um, so that's, that's the idea of the quantity extrapolation from invariance. And the conclusion we get is that the quantities extrapolate okay, but not, not perfectly because our standard deviation measure is probably uh, kind of wrong and maybe we should have had a 
larger standard deviation so that it's really a five standard deviation event rather than a six standard deviation event, but we don't think that invalidates the theory. Um, maybe pause again. So there is a question um, from Tukan Tutun. Um, these large orders are known because they all caused a stock market crash. Would it be possible that your data set is missing some very large orders that are similar in size and that did not cause a stock market crash? Okay, well, Tukan is a, you know, is a PhD student of mine. <laughs> so we've talked about this before. And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, this is a, a, hopefully this is an issue that the uh, audit trail that is being uh, produced by the SEC uh, could help us answer. And it's also a question that, uh, that uh, potentially could be answered with, by the CFTC with the audit trail data uh, that they um, actually have. Um, and we do know that for the flash crash, the flash crash order was a gigantic order. And it was, uh, says in the flash crash report that it was the most gigantic order of all the orders that had occurred uh, year to date, uh, you know, in the first six months of 2010. So um, it, 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 it's certainly the case that that particular event was the biggest, but it doesn't rule out the possibility there could have been some other big, big events in earlier uh, years that didn't cause uh, crashes. So this is something to study and uh, you know, why, why they wouldn't cause crashes. Maybe uh, uh, there's a kind of an underwriting process that either occurred formally or informally. And it's a very good question. Um, any other uh, questions? If, if not, I, I need to kind of hurry up. <laughs> so okay. I'll just keep going. Um, so thank you. so, so, um, so that, that's kind of the way to think about the um, extrapolation of the sizes of the bets. But what about extrapolating the price impact? Well, uh, here's a formula from uh, kind of from, from the paper. And uh, we're basically looking at the percentage price impact, you can then call it delta P over P, that results from a bet of size X. Think of it as X shares, but it's a fraction of volume, X over V. And we, multiply, we standardize the volume by 0.01. So we think of um, the this, this sort of standard price impact would be 1% of average daily volume. Um, and if you're, uh, uh, if you, to try to think about it consistently, it should be proportional to sigma, the volatility of the asset. So if you just kind of scale up the volatility of the asset, perhaps you should also scale up the price impact. So multiplying it by sigma is understandable. That's what the square root model does. That's what a lot of other models would do. Um, but what uh, our, our extrapolation does that's different is that in addition to multiplying by sigma, it also multiplies by P times V times sigma again all raised to the exponent one third. So it multiplies by the cube root of trading activity. Trading activity is defined as PV sigma. And so what this is saying is that the price impact of an order when you express it as a fraction of average daily volume is much bigger in a more liquid market. This is totally counterintuitive uh, to what most people uh, think. But, but this can be quite a, a significant amount because the, the, the trading activity in the market as a whole, which is the sum of all the trading activity and all the stocks plus all the trading activity and all the futures markets, you know, it's, it's going to be hundreds of times more than the trading activity in a typical stock and probably about a thousand times more. So when you take the cube root, you get 10. And so that means that the price impact for the market as a whole is going to be 10 times larger than what you would guess based on just extrapolating horizontally across individual stocks. So let me put this in perspective the way the paper's currently written. The way the paper's currently written, we think of this conventional wisdom as the idea that the elasticity of demand for a stock uh, can't be less than one. And what that would mean is if you want, you're gonna sell a big, big block of a, of a stock, which a big block might be one-tenth of 1% 1 of the stock, um, which you could think of as 10 basis points of market cap, then your price impact should be 10 basis points. Well, that's obviously way too small. Um, but if you look at the literature on block trades, or if you look at our portfolio transition paper, you'll find that they're all very consistent. Um, and it, these literature on block trades goes back a long time. Uh, you have a paper um, by uh, uh, Krauss and Stoll, you know, you have papers by Kaim and Modavine, and then more recently you have the, what I call the picture book by uh, uh, Jim Angel and Larry Harrison, uh, Chester Spat. They all suggest, you know, price impacts of maybe uh, not 10 basis points uh, for a gi gigantic, super gigantic bet, um, but maybe 100 basis points. Um, the, the numbers are actually smaller because most of the bets are, are smaller than that. But even um, 
uh, multiplying the price impact by a factor of 10, which is what the block trade literature in our portfolio transition uh, research suggests uh, relative to the conventional wisdom, that's not enough to get, a, to get a stock market crash. You need to multiply it by a factor of 100. And so um, this, is the, uh, this is what happens in this formula that uh, when you just do the uh, estimation for individual stocks, you get a price impact that's 10 times larger than the, approximately 10 times larger than the conventional wisdom says. So selling one tenth of 1% 1 of market cap of an individual stock would, would send prices down 100 basis points, not 10 basis points. Um, but now extrapolate it further to the market as a whole, selling 1% uh, of market cap of the entire mar stock market is gonna send prices down 10%. So that, that's kind of approximately order of magnitudes of what Jerome Curviel's uh, trades were. And so we get this extra factor of 10 by taking the cube root of uh, trading activity, which might be, uh, let's say a thousand times bigger for the market as a whole. Okay, so I've been intentionally using very, um, very uh, uh, round numbers. So the numbers in the paper aren't exactly this, but this is pretty close to what the numbers in the paper uh, would show that we are gonna get a, a, an elasticity of demand for the market as a whole of something like 0 0.01, 100 times smaller than the conventional wisdom and therefore price impact is 100 times larger. Um, so let me, um, let, me pause. I, I, uh, let me pause here in case there are any questions about this. So don't... I don't Sorry, uh, I yeah. forgot to unmute myself <laughs> and talk. Uh -huh. um, there are a couple of questions that are also, I think, related to the previous discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. So the first one is from Ji Chen. These days, clients apply algos to slice and dice large orders to minimize market impact. Does that mean that these unusual large orders will be harder to detect or reveal themselves now? And also a comment from, uh, a same comment, uh, also a significant volume goes through the dark pool these days. Does it make it even harder to identify such large orders? And the, and the, and the answer is back in the old days, you could identify large bets in, in many cases, but not all cases by looking at block trades on the ticker tape. So if you look at the TAC data, I have a paper with Tukan Tuzin and Anya about this. If you look at uh, prints on the, on the TAC data, you could see block trades and you can see that the distribution back in the 1990s was very similar to what we predict from invariance. But nowadays with slicing and dicing, if you look at TAC data, and look at the distribution of the bet sizes, you don't see that at all. So you're gonna to have to get it from audit trail data. And the audit trail data is gonna to have to have a, a unique identifier of a trader and then aggregate all the trades the trader did, not only on the, uh, on the official exchange, but also in all the dark pools and everywhere else, uh, aggregate it together. So the answer to the question is, nowadays you're gonna need audit trail data because the block trades don't show up um, as prints in the uh, uh, TAC data. And by the way, if they've so ever shown up as prints in the futures market, because they just printed prices, <laughs> not quantities. Mm -hmm. Peter Lerner asks, does that mean that ETFs can destabilize market much out of proportion to their market cap? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know about out of proportion to their market cap, but uh, yeah, but the answer is they can certainly destabilize markets because um, uh, you know, extrapolating these numbers, I suggested a couple hundred billion of ETF sales of stock market ETFs, you know, across lots of ETFs that are all broadly measured by the stock market, uh, measures of the stock market, we think would send prices down, um, you know, a thousand basis points, you know, 10% or so. So the answer is uh, ETFs that, um, you know, selling 1% of the market cap of the underlying of an ETF um, or even 10 basis points of the underlying of, an e of, of a market-based ETF, we think would cause a crash or even if it was across a bunch of ETFs as arbitrage will keep the markets together. So these are exactly um, some of the questions I think are interesting. Any other? There is one more uh, and then we'll uh, move on. So from mm -hmm. Essen Anur, following market crashes such as the flash crash, we know exchanges introduced circuit breakers such as velocity logic. How would a market with and without circuit breakers be expected to react to large orders? Okay, uh, yeah, so let me answer this question. I, I figured I'd get a question about this that's related to these implementation issues. So, you know, to clearly to implement our idea, we need to think about what the boundaries of the market are. Um, and this is a very interesting question for future research, but we also need to think about permanent and transitory price impact, which is I think behind uh, uh, this question. Um, and uh, it, one of the big issues is are the, are when we developed the invariance theory, we developed it by thinking of a bet 
as something that moves the price down a demand schedule, kind of like in my 85 paper where the market makers offered this fixed demand schedule and you move down the demand schedule. But more recently, uh, we've been doing uh, research on uh, what we you might call smooth trading or flow trading where people don't trade, uh, don't think of their price impact as moving down a fixed demand schedule, but they think of the price impact being greater if they trade faster. Um, but if we call this temporary price impact, and the idea is that while you're trading, prices are going to be, by, while you're selling, prices are going to be lower. The faster you're selling, even lower uh, the prices uh, will go. And uh, if you uh, slow down your trading and spread it out over time, prices won't go down as low. At any rate, this extra price impact you get based on the speed with which you sell is temporary, and prices come back um, after that. And it does suggest that we may want to think, think about um, circuit breakers from the perspective of this flow trading. Um, one way to think about it is to try to limit the speed with which people can trade, but uh, that, that's hard to implement that. Another way to think about it is, is to stop the market for a while so that you can essentially stretch out time so that you force people who are trading in a hurry to trade uh, more slowly. Um, so um, this is, I think, a hugely important question for uh, future research. Um, so an another issue uh, is that uh, in these five crashes, the market mechanism itself was was changing. You know, index arbitrage occurred differently. Slicing and dicing occurred differently. Electronic order handling occurred differently. Um, tick size might be relevant to certain uh, uh, aspects of uh, certain things. Um, even the way that uh, 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 banks were organized to do trading uh, changed uh, quite a bit. So there are a huge number of issues here that I think deserve research. So um, I, this is intentional. I'm gonna skip all the way down to, um, I have a long discussion here of each of the five stock market crashes, um, but I wanna skip down to just the summary slide and talk about them for the next few minutes that I have, um, uh, and then I'll be done. <clears throat> so this is a summary of what uh, we got from the five stock market crashes, and it, it relates to the, the questions that, that are being asked. Um, if you look at the stock market crash of 1929, the actual price decline was about 25%. You know, it was kind of over two big days of crashes that were, uh, that were more, more than 10% each. We predict a 49% crash. So in other words, we predict a bigger crash than occurred. And it raises the question in our mind of um, why we're predicting so much more than, than what actually happened. And we think that markets back then were probably more resilient than they are today. Um, and this is a, a good question for research, uh, both in macroeconomics and in market microstructure. Why would markets have been more resilient in 1929 and they, than they are today? Well, one answer is that banks in 1929 were providers of liquidity. Um, the, the Fed was actually telling the banks to sit on some uh, uh, liquidity and not loan money to finance stock speculation because they thought there might be a crash. And if the crash occurred, they thought the banks would be needed to provide liquidity, which it, the crash did occur and the banks were needed and did provide the liquidity. Well, in, in, in today's world, banks are consumers of liquidity. Um, you saw that in the 2008 housing crisis where it was the banks that were leveraged borrowing uh, short term and they had to delever. And that was very disruptive. So that would be one reason. And another reason is that the way people thought about the market in 1929 was less integrated than the way they think about it today. You know, now we think about the stock market as one big market. We have ETFs where you can trade the whole market. But back then, it was almost like each stock was its own universe. Well, our theory predicts that if each stock is its own universe, price impact is going to be much smaller because that extrapolation based on W to the one third power. Uh, for the whole market, it doesn't apply to 29. It would be the extrapolation of, let's say, 100 different stocks, each with their own W, but, but each W would be much smaller. Okay, uh, let me uh, go to uh, highlight some of these other crashes. Um, the 87 crash and the 2008 um, uh, Societe Generale crash. Um, in, in 87, the market fell about 40%. We predicted it would be about 20%. Um, so why did it fall? twice as much as we predicted. We think there are a couple of answers to that. One was that our measure of the 40% decline includes some declines that occurred kind of before the heavy portfolio insurance selling that actually motivated the heavy portfolio insurance selling. So, you know, that, that would have been 5% or maybe even 10. Can't remember the exact numbers. Um, but then in addition to the, and so that, that would, uh, taking that into account would bring the two numbers closer together. But in addition to that, the market mechanism itself kind of fell apart uh, after the crash on Monday, people worried about the solvency of the CME. They worried about the solvency of the 
NYSE and the solvency of the specialists, the solvency of the brokerage firms, um, they worried about whether margin calls could actually be met. They, they would be they worried about gridlock in the in the payments mechanism, and the result was a bigger crash we think than would have otherwise occurred. So we think that our um, story here um, is consistent with our prediction being a bit smaller than the 40%. Now, if you look at the Societe Generale, um, we actually came very close to, predict, to, to uh, uh, explaining actually what happened there. Th they were given three days to secretly liquidate the trades. Um, markets fell about 10%. We predicted a slightly bigger decline, but there's a lot of noise in our uh, predictions. So we predicted about the, the correct amount. Uh, for the Societe Generale trades. And that was an example uh, where, uh, except for the liquidation of these trades, there wasn't that much unusual going on, but there were some unusual things going on. For one, the Fed had an emergency meeting on the day that they started doing the liquidations when the market first crashed. And the liquidations, um, uh, the, 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 as a result of the emergency meeting, the Fed cut the uh, interest rate by 75 basis points, a kind of unprecedented gigantic cut. And that would have reduced the amount of impact of the uh, sales. So that might explain some of the difference between the nine and the 12. And then finally, when we look at the flash crashes, our predictions were much, much smaller declines than actually occurred. And so what we think happened in the flash crashes is that the traders were trading very quickly uh, compared to what uh, a kind of typical speed of execution would be. In the case of the 2010 flash crash, they traded over like 20 minutes or something the SEC and CFTC went out and asked traders how, how um, there was an order, the, the order was for like $4 billion by one, one uh, trader. They went and asked traders if you were gonna trade $4 billion, how long would it take you? And the answers they got were much longer than 20 minutes, you know, maybe a couple of hours uh, because it would be a gigantic uh, amount. And so this idea of uh, smooth trading and that price impact has also got a, a, a very important component that's proportional to how fast you're trading seems to be well illustrated by both of these flash crashes. And it explains a factor of 10 difference between our prediction of a 50, point, a 50 basis point decline and the actual decline of 5%. Um, and indeed, if you were trading 10 times faster than you should have, the transitory impact should have been 10 times greater. And that matches exactly the difference between 50 basis points and 500 basis points. And also suggests that when you finish executing the bet, prices should bounce back. At least 90% of it should bounce back, which in, indeed is actually what happened. Prices bounce back. And in the Soros trades, prices bounce back as well. So uh, let me, uh, I, I could pause for questions, but I'm out of time. So let me just uh, close by, by um, discussing some points. That, that the price impact of invariance is it's large and similar to actual price changes. As I mentioned, the 29 markets seem to be very resilient. Uh, the speed of liquidation, as I discussed for the uh, flash crashes, seems to magnify these short uh, term uh, price effects. And then as I discussed with this comparing the six standard deviation event to the five standard deviation event, it seems like the standard, if you're trying to think of a distribution of the size of bets, we got a standard deviation that was too small, maybe because we just focused on portfolio transition orders, which are one special type of, of bet. Standard deviation is, should be bigger. If it's 15% bigger, we get the frequency of crashes uh, correct. And so we think early warning systems might be useful and practical. For example, if the um, uh, uh, French regulator had uh, asked uh, on, on a, on a, over Jaiva or me uh, what the price impact would be of the liquidation of Joan Carviel's positions, we would have told them 10%, and that would have been pretty useful information um, in that context. So I'll, I'll stop here and take uh, further questions or general discussion. Thank you very much. So we have now enabled uh, the raise hand function. So if you want to ask a question, you could just just uh, raise hand and we'll give you the permission to talk. And uh, I see there's a question from Pankaj Jain in, uh, in the Q&A. So I'll just, you can unmute yourself and just ask it in person. Yeah, my question is about uh, leverage trading. Like there are these 3X and the SEC one considering 4X levered ETFs. So when you trade those, uh, do you think that's trading at three times the speed or uh, or do you think differently about uh, levered, uh, uh, leveraged trading? Okay, uh, for my for first answer to that question is Tukan Tuzun has a very nice paper that he wrote several years ago that discusses this issue. And the first thing you wanna do, if it's a 3X leveraged ETF, 
uh, then you want to take the dollar volume in that ETF and multiply it by three to just make it comparable, let's say, with S&P 500 futures. Um, the second thing uh, you want to do is uh, uh, take a look at the strategies the leverage ETFs use for rebalancing. And my understanding is that they tend to rebalance every day. So, uh, you know, kind of at the end of each day. And the, uh, that was similar to what the portfolio insurance uh, uh, traders did in 1987. And uh, Tukan uses this uh, an analogy um, in uh, his paper uh, on this. So it's pretty rapid uh, uh, updating of the quantities that you want to trade. Not, it's not like they're doing it uh, in minutes, even though they are doing it at the end of the day, maybe in minutes. But you can think about them as, as doing it over the course of the day. Um, so we think that trading in these leveraged ETFs is destabilizing in the same way that portfolio insurance was destabilizing uh, back in uh, 1987. Um, and so we think it's a genuine issue. So the question is, is would there be enough uh, volume or enough, if you think of the rebalancing of the uh, leveraged ETFs as being a kind of big bet that occurs kind of every day, the question is whether that rebalancing is big enough to generate um, a stock market crash? And the answer that Tukan got in his paper, if I remember it correctly, was something like um, a 1% decline in the market at the time that he was writing his paper would result in an extra billion dollars of selling. And so if you uh, looked at what our measures of market impact was, we, we thought that a billion dollars of selling might, might push the market down by about 1%. <laughs> And so you can see that you could have a self-fulfilling spiral of downward uh, price pressure um, resulting from the rebalancing of leveraged ETFs if they were big enough. Um, there's this interesting question that was raised earlier about whether um, the, there's a coordination problem. Um, so you would think that the, the, ET, the leveraged ETFs rebalance every day. So there, uh, there should, the market should have co coordinated by now. There should be people that are taking the other side of the rebalancing trades of the leveraged ETFs, at least on days where the price movements are kind of typical, you know, less than 1% or less than two or 3%. Um, but if you've got a 10% or 5% even move in prices on a, on a given day, uh, is there enough coordination in the market for the correct traders to step up to the plate and take the other side of the uh, ETF trades? Now, I personally think that uh, target date retirement funds should be doing the opposite. They should be rebalancing, which is to say buying when prices fall, selling when prices rise. But my suspicion is they don't rebalance at the same frequency that the leveraged ETFs do. Um, and so there may be a problem there that um, even though the target date retirement funds will eventually move in and rebalance, it might take them a month or two or even a year to do rebalance. And the leveraged ETFs want to rebalance in one day. So this mismatch creates a very interesting possibility for a crash that, that might be temporary, um, you know, it might, might last for uh, you know, a month or a year, um, or it might uh, just last for a few days. So I think it's a fascinating question. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Peter Lerner. Peter, you oh, should no. be able to speak now. Oh, no, uh, it was a mistake. Uh, uh... Ah, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just saw the hand raised. Yeah. Uh, Chao Jun Wang, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, Pete. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so this is a little bit unrelated to the, the, the scope of the paper, or beyond the scope of the paper. But what do you think about you know, all those, um, I don't know, maybe high frequency traders? Why, why don't they buy the dip? This is related to the, your last comment. Uh, there oh, might be... Well, this is okay. this is not this is not unrelated at all. Okay. Um, if, and we uh, we discuss this when we talk about uh, the flash crash, um, or, or at least we yeah, have on the flash crash where we discuss this. So if you look at the high frequency traders in the market and ask what kind of uh, strategy do they follow, the answer is they they have a holding period that's very short. You know, maybe a minute or two on average. And furthermore, they they seem to have very rigorous and very um, binding risks constraints. And so in our flash crash paper with uh, Tukan Tuzun, Andre Karolinko, and um, Merat Samadhi, we looked at this and found that they tended never to go beyond an inventory of plus or minus a couple hundred million dollars. Um, and yet the order that came in on the day of the flash crash was for $4 billion. 
So you can see right there, if you've got a $4 billion bet that's gonna be executed over 20 minutes, and you've got high frequency traders who are never gonna hold more than an inventory of $200 million and are gonna be trying to get out, or trying to reverse the inventory within one or two minutes, that the selling of the $4 billion over 20 minutes is just gonna run over the high frequency traders. Um, and they might try to sell, but they may have some difficulty actually selling because the, the, the big bet, the 4 billion is still being dumped into the market while they're trying to sell. And this is exactly what happened in the flash crash. The high frequency traders appear to have tried to sell, but they wound up kind of selling to each other, to one another. And they did lose a lot of money during that 20 minute period. But when the 20 minute period ended, they still hadn't gotten out of their inventories, which was actually good for them because the market bounced back immediately and they made up all the money that they lost. Um, so the, the high frequency traders are just, um, you know, they're, the, uh, they're picking up pennies in, in front of the steamroller and the market crash is uh, kind of like the steamroller. Uh, they're just gonna get run over if they try to stand there and stop the steamroller. And I think that the same actually is true of the specialists stopping the 87 crash um, or the uh, uh, market makers at the CME stopping the 87 crash, you know, they're, they're just too small. Um, I actually did some work when I was working for the Brady Commission and kind of documented that, that the, the market makers at the CME, they didn't hold, they were turning over positions pretty quickly. You know, the holding period was maybe every five, five minutes or so, they were turning over positions and they never were gonna take enough to, a big enough position to take the other side of the uh, portfolio insurance selling at 87. So, so, so is it fair to say that, um, the, that there is no market participants that are big enough, uh, not the high frequency traders, maybe not the banks or the dealers or the specialists, they're, none of them are big enough to, 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 to use this strategy to profit in the market? Well, uh, certainly the market makers are not big enough. The, the, the floor traders at the CME, they're not big enough. The specialists on the New York Stock Exchange, they're not big enough. The high frequency traders, to me, they're just the same thing as the floor traders or the specialists just updated to modern technology. They're not big enough. Um, and so who is big enough? Um, we actually studied this in 87 and you, you could study it now if you had better audit trail data. But, but my answer to that is, is it's the big hedge funds. Big hedge funds are opportunistic. They're, they're looking, or at least some of them, are, are looking for opportunities uh, to trade. They're looking for opportunities where they can sometimes employ a significant amount of capital. And although the hedge fund industry was different in 87 from what it is now, when we looked at the people that were buying on the day of on October, you know, somebody was buying on October 19, 1987, um, and you, you need to adjust it for the index arbitrage that was taking place, but there needed to be some net buyers somewhere. And uh, in the futures market, the net buyers were what we would nowadays call hedge funds. And if you looked in the cash market, the net buyers were probably what we nowadays would call big pension funds that were uh, uh, at least in the market and willing to deploy a lot of capital. The trading desks at the banks might, might deploy some capital. They might be kind of like a hedge fund, but they're probably not big enough to deploy enough capital to take the other side. You know, think about Jerome Curviel, 50 billion euros. That's a lot of uh, risk. And most banks don't, uh, you, know, you know, people at Societe Generale panicked when they realized <laughs> how big of an inventory that was because the bank uh, didn't have nearly enough capital to be uh, uh, trading that much. And other banks didn't want to take risks of that size either. So um, it would be, You'd have to kind of search widely to find uh, traders that would be willing to take the other side. And that, that would explain why prices went down 10%. It's a really fascinating question. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. So we don't have any raised hands at the moment, and it's also noon. So at this point, the official part of the seminar is over, and I just wanted to say that I hope that we'll see you all in two weeks. So on December 1st, we'll have Evangelos Benes talking to us about the cost of clearing fragmentation. And if you have, if anybody has any further questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll unmute you. And if not, Pete, thank you so much for okay. coming and for joining us. It's uh, really a pleasure to have you. And Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I will uh, stop sharing my screen, although I guess we're, we're about done. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete.